Hello, I'm Paul Gravett, and uh, this is the next uh, lecture, next, next discussion, in fact, uh, as part of CIEE Kyoto's summer course on Japanese manga and art. And uh, this time it's a change of format because I'm delighted to welcome Dan Byron. Hello, Dan. Hello, good to see you. Hey there, and we're going to have a little uh, discussion about otaku culture, um, which is a phenomenon um, uh, that we we are both part of in many ways. Um, myself, of course, as a uh, as a fan, but also as a curator, and Dan as a artist, and also someone working um, with the Hyper Japan London events, uh, and also running other activities like the London Manga Artist Meetup. So we both are, I suppose kind of otaku <laughs> in our way yeah, we um, I think it means obsessive fan so I think that describes yeah. us quite well I think it? so it's beyond the word fan isn't it it's, it's yeah, definitely obsessive so. has to be in there somewhere too it isn't an easy word to translate um directly because people use the word you know geeks or nerds I've also come across um, couch potato as one another translation of it but it's a special word to Japan. So just to briefly, the uh, opening image here, of course, is, uh, is um, uh, cosplay. We'll be discussing that a little bit as well. Costume play. Um, uh, and we're going to start off, I thought, with an image here of, uh, of you, Dan, uh, in cosplay. Um, Very low effort cosplay right there. <laughs> well, tell, just tell us what you, what you, who you are and how you managed to cosplay. Uh, so this, um, yeah, I dressed as Yoshikage Kira from uh, Jojo's Part 4, but obviously in darker colours, I, I wasn't going to go and buy a purple suit and a green shirt. Right. So that's, that's I literally made quite it. Quite obsessive enough there, I don't think, Dan. Yeah. And this was a, a, an event at the British Museum we had last year with Hyper Japan, yeah. where we had cosplayers at the British Museum, so I thought it was fitting for me to be in cosplay too. Absolutely, totally. totally. So cosplay doesn't have to be super elaborate, it can be just, because in this case you brought the tie, didn't you? You've got the right... Yeah, and slipped my hair back, and I've got a cardboard cutout stand on my hand and holding a brown paper bag, because Kira likes to carry females' uh, hands that he's chopped off. Oh, yes. Bag, so. <laughs> not quite that far to put anything inside the bag, though, hopefully. No, oh, oh, actually there was a cardboard cutout hand in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh you did. Excellent. So yeah. Hyper, just tell us briefly, I mean, Hyper Japan is really the, the, the big event for, and not just for Otaku, it's for, for many different interests, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, they, they market it as a Japanese cultural show, but it's definitely been overrun by uh, the whole sort of manga and gaming culture uh, right. and cosplaying and fashions and things like that. It's a little bit like the, the big Japan Expo that happens in Paris, isn't it, as well? Mm. Yes, and I would imagine not not actually the kind of thing that is exactly happening in Japan itself. Because they don't need to have a an all interesting <laughs> here's everything about Japan kind of festival because they would have all their special festivals. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's great. I've worked with them for six years now. Um, and I've done a variety of stuff with them and sort of help out behind the scenes when I can. And and also, of course, you you also get to meet quite a few. Uh, famous yeah. guests along the way as well so it gives you an inside track yeah. for that yes it's, it's amazing yeah fantastic yeah. to work with well we're gonna i'm just gonna jump here to the um uh this word otaku just to go off in a little bit into, into some background for the students watching this um mm -hmm. and this i mean there's a i'm not going to go into all the complicated um origins of the term except it did essentially emerge from from a rather negative point of view towards um, fans um, and certainly not a positive thing um, mm. but it, it, it also unfortunately got attached to quite some quite dark um, news stories. I think it was a, there was a famous or infamous we should say really a murderer who was labelled an otaku murderer because he happened to have rather a lot of anime and maybe horror movies and pornography etc um, and so the label it became quite negative uh, over time but it's been kind of addressed I think and, and redressed and corrected this is a fairly early um, documentation of this phenomenon in, in Japan um, and I'm going to just jump ahead also to this text which is from the text that the students are reading and although it's of course full of lots of academic jargon it does actually um, narrow down to some really quite interesting um, points about the fact that particularly now with the internet, uh, this has become, of course, the perfect uh, interaction, the perfect place for, for, for otaku, for fans to meet each other and to commune, um, alongside all the other activities that, that 
that, that go on. In your case, Dan, did, did you come across this term? And is it a term that amongst your friends, do you call yourselves otaku? Is it, a, is it kind, of, kind of being co-opted to be a more positive term now? I, I would say it's a po more positive term now because I'm sure there's businesses that use the word otaku in, in their name yeah. and things like that, but pe perhaps only Western ones. I think it's still quite a negative thing and, or an insult to say someone's an otaku in Japan. I don't think Japanese yeah. people embrace the word like the Westerners do, perhaps. Exactly. That's rather like the word manga being different from, the, from inside and outside Japan, meaning different things. But, but the, the scale of it, I mean, there needs to be a word for this phenomenon because it is a phenomenon in Japan. This is um, Comic Ket, which I've always wanted to go to. I got invited once and I couldn't go and I'm still hoping. Have you been to this yet? Uh, I haven't actually been to Japan yet. So. <laughs> the, two of I, two, the two of us should go and have a trip. Then we should definitely do a trip to oh, Comic sure. Um, but it, it's on a scale that it's hard to imagine. And there's nothing like this. I mean, no disrespect to Hyper Japan, but I'm assuming your numbers are nothing like the <laughs> nearly half a million people that go for this. No, nothing like that, I um, don't think. And of course, the important thing about Hyper Japan is it's not covering all of Japanese culture or even all of um, otaku culture. It's very much focused on the self-publishing scene there, the doujinshi. And this is what I think is also quite hard for us to get around our head around because as I understand it, th there aren't many big name publishers there, are there? Like, like Shueisha, Kodansha, Shogokan, they don't bother to show up to this thing. No, I don't think they do at all. Perhaps as talent scouts or something, but yeah. that, that's all I'd imagine. Right, that's partly because I think people like, for example, Shonen Jump, for example, has its own festival, its own big events. They, they have their own branding. Yeah. Uh, they don't need to go to a, a kind of comic convention kind of, and be amongst many, many other things. They, they do their own marketing. Yeah, and people seek to be in Jump. Jump doesn't really need to look for talent, you know. No, the talent, talent for them. For them. Yeah. <laughs> All the enter competitions, of course, that's a good way to. Yeah. Um, I've added this extra slide, uh, slides here just to give, give people a flavor of what the, um, the, the Comic Cat catalog looks like. I, I haven't actually got my copy. Have you, have you got, a, got a copy of a Comic Cat? No, I don't have any Comic Cat catalogs. No, I only I, have a few Bojin works. I met around. the printer of the Comic Cat catalog. He came to London. And they gave me, and it's like a, it's so heavy and so thick, and it's got so much, it's 35, four, even more, thousand little boxes of the different um, Georginshi circles that are all making a new magazine. Uh, it is, wow. the output's astonishing, it really is. Yeah, it's, I, I don't think sort of our indie comics market is anywhere near no. sort of how, doji, how big doujins are. No, no, exactly. Yeah, so and it's because I think doji is like a magazine, and doji and it means same people, same person, and it's right. that you're in a uh, you're in a little kind of group of it's like a fanzine essentially, but it's you're in mm. the same people. The Otaku word doesn't use is dojinshi, mm. and I found I've I, I've got a few dojinshi, but this is these are a couple that I thought I'd post because there there is an aspect which is not everything, of course, in dojinshi, <laughs> but it's it comes out of the the shoujo manga, the shonen ai that I've been discussing in the previous lecture. And uh, this is a, a very special, um, uniquely, initially uniquely Japanese genre, uh, shouldn't I, that's been able to become yaoi, where, uh, have you come across these, these, these things, where, what, what they're like? Yeah, sort of erotic fan comics for popular series, aren't they? Um, uh, not, all, not all doujin is like that, some is, no, you know, no, totally no, independent. Yeah, there are plenty of the, the original ones, aren't there? Great. Right. I, love, I love the tiger and bunny one. That's a <laughs> yes. Yeah. And they are quite amusing, but they're also quite adult. And, um, yeah. But the other important thing about this is that you would think maybe that the copyright holders would be unhappy. What, what is their attitude generally, do you think, to these? I don't know. I don't know if there's much they can do about it, because I imagine artists use a pen name when they create something Absolutely. like this. So yeah, yeah. And of course, I think a lot of the time they're, they're not, they're not big circulation, are they? They're not exactly mm -hmm. you know, large print runs. That's part mm -hmm. of the mania of Comic Ed is that people plan where they're going to go to to buy the... the, the yeah, and they all run to the tables they want to get to. And... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> quite remarkable. Yeah, and, there, and really really there, there, there is also the thought, this is still, of course, promoting and marketing these characters, even if they are in copyright. Mm -hmm. And the scale of shops, the retail area, of course, of Akihabara is, is famous for being the kind of mecca of, mm. of, uh, of otaku and, and of fans of all kinds of uh, material. And I've been there, just only had a couple of hours there. I had, I had like 50 minutes in this shop, uh, 
mandarake, which oh, yes, is mandarake. Well, and I had, I had, the, I had, a, um, I could buy stuff, but it was just there's no time. You just can't possibly yeah. access so much. Yeah, you need a week, <laughs> just it's maybe in one store. These are so huge, and what's wonderful, mm -hmm. as I mentioned in the note here, is that it isn't really just for otaku. It really is because manga is so part of everybody's culture. Mm -hmm all age groups and backgrounds that uh, it's, it's uh, you know, for everybody. It really is for all, all interests. And a shop like Mandarake, you know, if you don't have much storage space in Japan, so once you're done with your manga, you can go and sell it to Mandarake, buy some other secondhand manga, pick things up really cheap. Oh, that's, and it will, that, oh, yeah. that's a nice night. I hadn't thought of that, of selling yeah. and then buying more. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. you can sell toys to them, everything. Yeah, there. it's not just books, of course, and comics, it's all kinds of Yeah, they deal in art, you know, I've, I've bought art from Mandarake and all oh, sorts. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're they, pretty good online too, aren't they? They're, they're very good with the English language side of things. They're so, one of the best trusted places for... They really are good, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. So we, I want to touch on how otaku have been portrayed and maybe also how the otaku phenomenon is also perhaps part of a slightly other more um, psychological issue which Japan is facing. And this is not to say that all otaku are many anyway like this, but this is perhaps one of the sweetest of the otaku um, stories. Have you come across this one? Yes, I do know Genji Ken. And it reminds me of my the rest of my bedroom actually that you can't see. <laughs> <laughs> it's not much better actually in, in my so-called library. My library has just become a huge mess really of stuff. Mm -hmm. I've got so much I've got storage. I've got so much material to look after. Mm -hmm. But it's, it was a story set in a, in a kind of in a college university um, club mm -hmm. or for fans of all kinds of popular culture, of course, including manga, and was turned into a successful anime. Um, and this NHK is an interesting one. Welcome to the NHK has an interesting otaku protagonist who has got his issues. He's a little bit shut in, he's a little bit, has, has some drug issues and some addiction to um, uh, perhaps unsavory anime material. <laughs> but it's, it's a clever uh, kind of conspiracy caper story. Did you ever come across this one? I'm not, I, I know the name. It's yeah. one of those very famous series, but I, it's not something I've ever uh, watched or read myself. No. No, it's an interesting one, especially because you would assume with NHK and title that uh, it would be to do with the TV channel. And in a weird, yeah. strange way, it is. It's some weird conspiracy theory that the character has about NHK being behind all kinds of sinister things in society. <laughs> and yeah, this is um, oh, this is uh, Train Man. This is actually was a phenomenon, wasn't it? Um, it was. for, uh, um, do you know? Do you know about this one? Yeah, so it was uh, on the Japanese message boards 2chan, which is quite, yeah. you know, we have 4chan in, in the US and stuff copied it. Uh, it was just a, some stories that were being told and no one quite knows if they're true or not. And people hope they were because it's quite a lovely story. You know, this nerdy guy stood up to a sexual predator on a train that was harassing a, a woman and sort of a love story blooms from then on. She buys him gifts and they meet and it's really sweet. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very, okay. very lovely story. So it might have been true. It might, would be nice if it was true. And it, it, yeah, it, people like to think it is. Yeah, and there, were, there were movies, there was anime, there were, I think, four different manga came out as well. But it did uh, portray as an, an empathetic otaku character. Yeah, I think it's a fairy tale for otaku that they'll yeah, meet yeah, yeah. a lady in a heroic circumstance, you know. Yeah, oh, and this and is a favourite of mine. Detroit Metal City, which has got this, this crazy drummer, Camus. Yeah, yeah, he's, it's hilarious. But he's definitely the stereotypical portrayal of attacking yeah, Japanese yeah. people. I mean, the whole, thing, the whole, his the whole and... manga is crazy and satirical, isn't it? Yeah. So it's not, it's it's not so to create illicit em uh, sort of empathy at all. No, not for anyone. <laughs> it's crazy, it's, like that, yeah. I love it though, it's so funny. And this is one I haven't read and it's not been put into English, I don't think. An interesting one from Oku, who's famous for Gantz and Inuyasha, mm. a story set in a unusual triangle of father son and uh, a girl that comes in that ends up um, uh, helping yeah, the son one's... escape from his uh, confinement this is what we bring in i think perhaps the issue of uh, hikikomori which is the yeah. the bigger social concern of uh, fans of or not just fans, anybody basically who becomes mm. perhaps they dropped out of university they find difficulty in the high pressure real world of of study and work and stay in their rooms and the parent their parents very often will end up looking after them as essentially um, a kind of someone who's withdrawn from, from life. And this is not a, 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 an unusual phenomenon, no, no, not unique to Japan, but it's become something which the Japanese are, are addressing and also sometimes addressing in, in manga. Mm. Yeah, so, it's, um, 
this maybe isn't exactly otaku culture, but I wanted to bring this in because it does um, bring up the issue of of how obsessive are you going to be, I suppose, and how. And if, if you're a shut in, perhaps naturally you will gravitate towards escapism. So whether yeah. you're a otaku first or become an otaku after yeah. developing anxieties and things. And in um, a way, I mean, not. I mean, we are currently through going through lockdown, which is not so. Yeah experience for, 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 for many of us we're having to yeah. focus on what we love and we can enjoy things virtually it's a question of coming back into the which is what I'll a lot of it it's about actually it's not about this it's about meeting it's about having a community having friends and interacting this is a particularly strong looking manga not available in English and mm -hmm. the facts are put up here which which the students can read when they pause the slide or, or review this but it is um, you know there's certainly concern at the numbers um, of people in this situation and even more the concern that as these people stay in their homes with their parents and their parents age and they age it's going to create a bit of a, uh, a bit of a crisis for for those families who can't uh, you know who can't Absolutely. support that's um, a really high number you know that's quite a large percentage of people <laughs> really yeah 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 i think there's, mm. there are many issues beyond beyond the otaku field that, that this this raises Mm. Let's get to, to, to happier places. That is the absolute opposite is Hyper Japan, which is all about bringing people together um, and also very often celebrating the different cults, I guess, within this huge field. What's your experience been with, with, with Hyper Japan and meeting, meeting, making new friends there, I guess? And yeah, I mean, I didn't know what to expect when I first, first sort of uh, offered to volunteer. And um, mm. yeah, I just got put with an amazing team working backstage. Basically, we just do the stage turnaround for all the bands that appear on stage so met a variety of you know anime theme song singers and japanese bands and uh pop stars and all sorts and as well as manga artists that have been interviewed on stage and yeah it's just a fantastic experience mm, 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 mm. And your your role there is 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 kind of as like part of the stage crew you're also but often you're actually looking after some of the guests you're having to get them from one place to the next, make sure they're being looked after. Yeah, yeah. Wrangling up the cosplayers is always quite difficult when you Tell run around. Um, yeah, so, you know, we've got a very short time between acts, maybe 10 or 15 minutes to get the next act prepared. Right. Uh, a friend of mine there. Um, so, yeah, you have to sort of run around and say, are you part of the cos parade? Are you part of the cosplay contest? And like, grab everyone together and then escort them all across the, <laughs> across the event. Right, right. And there's obviously special places for cosplayers to get changed. All of that is very yeah. after, isn't it? So because that, that, that's a concern too for people. And then you have had some, the, uh, Hyper Japan's had some, some pretty major guests from comics yeah. in the wider world of, uh, of uh, Japanese pop culture. So yeah. he's, and you he's get, a, yeah. you kind of here. It's amazing meeting him. He's uh, basically done any, any Godzilla posters you've seen that are a painting it's probably his work and the same oh. goes for Ultraman and things like that um, it's a so fantastic he, like, art, hasn't he really really good brilliant and uh, yeah. on the left there it's uh, Adita Sensei who I worked with last year he's a very well-known Pokemon trading card game artist yeah amazing amazing illustrator really really talented Absolutely. And behind you on your shelves you have some of your artwork yes. including some of these shikishi which yeah. you're able to collect yeah yeah I, I love them. Uh, personalized to you, I guess, and they are actually you watching them being drawn yeah. very often for you. They feel like a real product. They're they're a solid board, and yeah. I think usually they would be used for people would ask like ba baseballers or sports stars to sign or give a handprint or something like that. But uh, yeah. it's been adopted by manga artists too. Oh, is that right? Oh. Really lovely thing to own. Yeah, yeah, I love them. <laughs> It's, that must be extra special when, as I know you're quite a collector, but when you've actually been with, met the artist and they've done the drawing yeah. for you in front of your eyes, that's a, a yeah, whole other level, isn't it, to actually buying those things? It is, yeah. <laughs> right, uh, where are we now? Sorry. Oh, here we go, yeah. And uh, yeah, we could, we could come on, because it's been quite a year in the UK. I mean, obviously, now you haven't been to Japan. I've been to Japan just once for a, a math two, two to three weeks. But um, in London last year, we had the most amazing set of um, events going on. The British Museum put on the biggest exhibition of um, comic art. And about the photographs you sent here, this actually shows just some of the enormous variety of original artwork, which, as I've said in this caption, was the biggest 
show anywhere, even in Japan, they hadn't done this because the separate, the big publishers, like we, as we've mentioned, are so competitive, they wouldn't ever yeah. dream of putting their material together into one show. It was, it was mind blowing to see, was, you it? know, Astro Boy over there, like, you know, um, Fairy Tale over here, Dragon Ball over there. It's, it was mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. Now this is um, the British Museum, of course, for them, it was their biggest, I think, almost the, one of their, one of, if not the biggest attendance they ever had. I think they had something like 180,000, just an absurd number of visitors. Yeah. It was phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was very exciting. Um, and it was, also, it was quite, a few, quite a few big, big name uh, manga co came over for the first time. So for, for you and I, it was a thrill to be able to go and you know, hear them, see them talk and draw sometimes. and. Yeah, I had the best summer. It was great. <laughs> it was. It, it was. It was like being in Japan. Actually. Yeah, there was, there was so much going on for for a, for. I can't a time. count how many artists we sort of met and oh, no, no. during that time. Six, yeah, seven people. Really this, really this, this was when uh, I was able to interview uh, Takamiya Keiko at uh, yeah, Oz and get a chance to meet her. I think I remember mm -hmm. just slightly in the way there, but uh, I got my yeah. book signed and <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was great, fantastic. Yeah, they were very, they, they were all really, really charming people, really interesting. And the other yeah. great show yeah. that came was Agio Moto, wasn't it? Yeah. It's very, like, these are like huge superstars in Japan. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they never make public appearances or very rarely. Mm -hmm. So for, for us to have all of them within the space of two or three months, it was phenomenal. Yeah. And I think they were quite impressed by their reception as well. I, you know, I think so. I think so. It really was something very special, and it certainly mm -hmm. raised a lot of awareness uh, in the media here and internationally for, 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 for manga. I mean, nobody ever imagined that the British Museum would even do this uh, show about this. Now, we, this is also Japan House, we should mention, which was a pretty new venue in London. There's only three in the world. This is the third one to open, and they uh, put on their own show. It overlapped with the British Museum of uh, Uruso and Naoki's uh, amazing comics, um, yeah. uh, and that was a, another huge success, I think, for them. That was incredible. I think I went back to that three or four times because they kept changing the artwork that was on display. That's so it's amazing clever. to go. Back and... Yeah, yeah. I think they would. They would. They put the up um, for one story. I think it was the tennis story Yawara or something, where they put the episode. They they did the chapters that changed like every two weeks or something. They put a new one up. Yeah, I think all, all of the different stories there. They did that. Did they do that? They must have rotated through hundreds and hundreds of pages of his work. And that was Urasawa insisting that it was better to show complete episodes, not just isolated pages or spreads yeah. or something. He wanted people to be able to read the whole whole storyline because yeah, it's a really, story really, really good way to approach it, I think. It's really, yeah, really yeah. And he was a very, he's obviously much more used to being in public and very personable, wasn't he? Doing a lot very of charismatic work. guy, yeah. Um, yeah, he's just a really funny guy, plays some great music. Um, yeah, I, which I never really knew about him, that he was in a band. And I think he might be a bit more passionate about music than he is about manga, to be honest. <laughs> it yeah. seemed that way. Um, yeah. His career could easily have taken off with, uh, as a, as a, as a singer-songwriter or something, you know, yeah. kind of Bob Dylan type in a way. Yeah. yeah. And you had a chance to, to meet with him, of course, which was great for you. Yeah. Well, I had uh, you, luckily. Um, yeah, I spent almost a whole week you know, going to his events and workshops and talks and things he like gave, that. He gave a lot of himself, didn't he? Really, really did, didn't yeah. really turn up. He actually did lots of other things. Yeah, I don't know if he had a day off the ball. You made a special <laughs> drawing for him, didn't you? A gift drawing. I did, yeah. I drew on a blank shikishi and uh -huh. gifted it to him, which I just thought would be quite, quite funny. And he really appreciated it. <laughs> nice. Really nice. Yeah, because I know you're, you're a, a budding uh, manga artist yourself, so that, that, that it's Indeed, not just... Yeah. <laughs> More than budding, actually. Well, now, <laughs> talk a little about your collection because um, you've kind of sent me uh, uh, so many fantastic images, but I thought we'd show a few. And Absolutely. in a way, I think I gather maybe you began collecting anime cells. Is that right? Is that where really, really yeah. you I think back in the 90s, there was a manga magazine that on the back had anime cells for sale as a mail away thing. Wow. And I was like a teenager at the time, so I just bought a couple of cheap ones. I think one it was too from... expensive then. They weren't at all. One was four pounds, the other one was nine or something. And, <laughs> and they were just a couple of random cells, but then sort of slowly started collecting more and more through the oh. 2000s, including quite a few from the JoJo's OVA. Right. Yeah. 
the, right. like a personal favorite anime. I love, of mine. The, I love the way the paint is all gone off the off the edge like that. Yeah, you just splat it on. I think they must be really fast techniques for making those sort of backgrounds. Yeah, exactly. And the point is that what, do you prefer a possible to have the the cell plus the background? The two together is really what you're after, if you can. Yeah, if you can. It's very hard to get the real background sometimes. Like that one, I think, is a reproduction. But um, oh, I see. This, this one is a real painted background, which is oh. quite uncommon. Because, of course, what would happen is the background would be used for quite a few different shots and the cell yeah. is what changes. Therefore, the there are fewer, fewer backgrounds than cells. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, so I they can be worth quite a lot of money, just the background on its own. Right, right, interesting. And of course, some of the backgrounds are incredible. I mean, um, yeah. There's been exhibitions of them, haven't there? Just the, 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 yeah, the, the, the ghost in the shell ones um, yeah, exactly. that we had an exhibition of in the UK. That was yeah, yeah, yeah. So moving into getting the original Genga, which is the word for the original drawing. Gen means root mm. origin. Genga for manga, as in original uh, Japanese comic art. When, when this is one of the first pieces you picked up, and what 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 yeah. impressed you about seeing these these pieces? Just it's 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 hard to describe without actually being able to physically show you a piece of work, just yeah. penmanship, the sort of techniques that are used, um, the application of sort of uh, screen tones and things, and just really intricate, you know, you can stare at it quite closely for quite a long time, and just think like this is the work of a truly great artist that I'm holding right now. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of effort and detail uh, and care really? in these drawings, which you might almost think is almost more than they need because they're going to be read quite quickly. Yeah. They're often not it's necessarily really well printed, at least not in the magazines. No, yeah, that's very true. But there's real dedication and a feeling that, um, you know, that they must put everything into every panel as much mm -hmm. as possible. And these are you know, two, of, two of your favourites, certainly two of my favourites, because we both yeah. uh, like horror, scary manga. Yeah. And Oh, it's just so beautiful, isn't it? I, I mean, Kazuo Umezu's work, I love the way he draws scared people. <laughs> it's just fantastic. It's such beautiful work. It's worth mentioning, just I think, here also that I gather that there's not a lot of original artwork on the market. Certainly from some major artists, there's hardly anything at all. Yeah, very, very little from major artists. Um, so and things they, like Dragon they, Ball. We'll why never find they, not, them. they just choose not to sell? Is, it, uh, is there a reason for that? I, I really don't know, to be honest. Um, I think perhaps sometimes an author may pass away and their family just doesn't know what to do with all of their art, so they'll sell it to bookshops. And get some, yeah, yeah. some things get given away through competitions or perhaps an artist gives it to an assistant. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I'm really not sure. It, it seems certain stories do get out by artists, but not more recent ones. Uh, mm. Yeah, it's something that I've wondered about for years as well. Mm, mm, mm. This is this is a particularly spectacular double page spread, presumably a, probably, an, probably an opening spread, perhaps. Or, but what the, what the technique in this is just breathtakingly good. Um, layers and layers of yeah. screen tones and paint and ink, and it must take days and days to create one image like that. It's and he, he is the artist almost certainly working with assistants. You wouldn't be doing this entirely. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> imagine so. so. Yeah. 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 And this is also tremendously uh, dramatic. The, uh, yeah, this is one of my favourite pieces that I own. It's something I'll never part with. It's just like the penmanship. Is, is, that, is that sound effect, is that actually drawn onto the artwork or is it added, is it applied over the top? Is it actually part of the artwork? No, no that, that one is part of the artwork, but yeah. sometimes you will find that someone's drawn it and cut it out with a scalpel and just glued it on top of the artwork. Yeah, really, yeah. like well. But all of this is hand drawn. I don't think oh. there's much white paint. Perhaps the sort of splatters you see around the edges of the faces are bits yeah. of paint. But it's yeah. just really, really meticulously drawn. Pin sharp. Yeah, super accurate. Yeah. And of course, we're all looking at artwork in almost all the, the manga artwork is in, is in black and white, as we know from the from the magazines and the books. But then there are often special pages at the front of the stories that are in colour. Yeah. These are probably extra desirable in, in, in many ways. Yeah, they're really, really hard to come by. If oh, you find yeah. a painted manga page, it's, it's really uncommon. Mm. And I think things like that get snapped up first when they get on the market as well. So yeah. I've, I've been very lucky to get some of the pieces that I've managed to get. Well done. And of course, a lot of times they don't even get necessarily reprinted in colour in the, in the books, do they? They'll just get into... No, it might just be one glossy page in the magazine or two glossy pages. And then in the book, it will be just in grey. It's, it's quite tragic, really. It's quite <laughs> sad. But 
And your, this is a beautiful piece here by, by a, a sketch by uh, the late Taniguchi, uh, one of my, I think our favorites too, a beautiful, fantastic story. And then you've, you've got a big enough collection now that you've actually just set up your own website where people can buy some have, of the yeah. that you're letting go of. I'm yeah, sure. and I'm, you know, know, once doing that, yeah. once events are open again, I hope to have a stall at events like Hyper Japan and Comic Con and things yeah. selling original manga art because there's just you don't really see it anywhere. Yeah. And I think once people see just how beautiful it is, it's yeah, they'll snap it up. I, <laughs> I hope. Will. I think they will. And you're obviously still going to carry on collecting, so you're a dealer and collector at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah, I've got to it's sell. A dangerous some combination. <laughs> <laughs> I just added this side at the end because uh, it's quite nice to celebrate, um, yes. not just in the UK, but just to, to in, in, encourage perhaps the students that are watching here who are maybe wanting to make their own manga uh, or know people that want to do this, that there is a, there are competitions. I mean, certainly local ones. We have one in the UK called Manga Jiman, which means Manga Pride. But then, um, you know, well, you've entered Manga Jiman and, and so did uh, Shangamore Edunjobi, who went on to enter the international prize, the international award organized by the Japanese government to promote manga and uh, was the first Brit to win a silver. Uh, and yeah. that's, that's quite an achievement. I mean, he, yeah, he, and now his work is immortalized in the Kyoto Manga Museum. You know, you can, right? if you go in there, yeah, if you go in there, you can find in the, the sort of doujin section, you'll find Shango's work somewhere. Right. Yeah, because he was, I know he was invited out there, wasn't he, as part of the, the prize to meet publishers and editors and to, to, to connect to network which is such a valuable thing so there is there is this is one path anyway for for uh, people around the world to uh, enter the manga field and it does demonstrate also the government's use of manga of otaku culture in general as a kind of soft power diplomacy to convey how cool japan is as if we yeah. need to be told <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yes. Thank you so much, Dan. And uh, it's been no good luck to you with, uh, with we hope, obviously hope Happy Japan makes it makes a return once uh, it's safe to do so. And uh, oh, in the meantime, you. you're, you're still running your um, meetup. Is that right? Yeah, we have. Well, we have virtual manga meetups at the moment. Oh. So, uh, yeah, it's good fun. So you, you can really, be drawing together and see each other's work. Virtually. Yeah, basically. Um, yeah. And just chat about what we've been watching and reading. Same as we usually do when we meet in a coffee shop, you know, it's uh... exactly excellent. That's really, really good. That, that's happening still. Thank you so much for this. I think it's given people a, a real good insight into uh, what it means to be otaku, to be, yeah. <laughs> which we definitely are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dan. Bye for now. Yes. Bye bye.